and welcome to our first episode of Mass Mission Files, a new show on MassTracker.com. For our first couple episodes, we are going to dive into an episode of Cartoon and talk about the best and most controversial moments of that episode. Now, you may be wondering, who are these crazy girls and why are they talking about Mass? Well, these crazy girls watched the same cartoons as you guys did growing up in the 80s. And Mass just so happens to be one of our all-time favorites. It had such a great group of diverse cast of characters who were fighting crime on the side against the terrorist organization, Venom. They had these awesome, transforming vehicles and amazing, powerful masks and had such great, adventurous storytelling in each episode. But, like you guys, we also were frustrated about the lack of continuity, the lack of character development, and then there was the racing series, which completely changed everything. Darcy and I have been writing mass fanfiction for over 20 plus years on the fanfiction net, and we're pretty proud of our mass legacy saga that we created. It was our way of going above and beyond, developing characters more, expanding out the universe, and trying to keep Mask alive. So who best to go into the cartoon further than two girls who completely overanalyzed it? Absolutely. And we're really excited to be on the channel, first of all, and we want to give a big thank you to Bill for giving us the opportunity to keep Mask alive and talk about our fan fix and favorite parts of the cartoons. We're going to start with our five favorite episodes and we're going to see where the ride takes us. Um, and if you don't have the DVD set, you can follow along on YouTube. All of the episodes are out there as well. So today's episode, we are going to cover the very first episode, so The Death Zone. And the ages in the episode are Brad Turner, Rusato, Alex Sector, Condom Flame, Dusty Hayes, and Buddy Hawks, with the Venom agents being Miles Mayhem, Cliff Dagger, and Spyrax. So the episode begins with an asteroid crash landing on Earth, and an investigative team, including Perse Professor Stevens, finds out the meteor may have healing properties before Venom steals it in a very bad alien ship disguise, I mean bad. Uh, the professor discovers Venom's deceit and is forced off the road by Rax and Dagger. She wakes up at Matt's mansion and explains to him her distress. He calls up the math team to investigate and then Scott, of course, plays spy and tags along. Meanwhile, Venom has split the Death Stone, as they're calling it, into three destructive pieces to sell to the highest bidders. Um, the main story driver here is Hondo being seriously injured, protecting a stowaway Scott during Mask's first attempt to secure the Death Stone. He's caught in the crossfire between Condor and Swishblade. The Mask team splits up with Brad and Dusty both recovering a piece of the stone. The last piece Scott and T-Bob managed to track. Um, they track the meteor's location and notify Mask team using switchblade communications, and then they escape in a truck. Matt attempted to get the last piece, but with help, was held up by switchblade and lost sight of the plane he was chasing. In the end, though, the team thought they failed the mission with only two pieces of the stone, but Scott surprises everyone with having the stone in the back of the truck he and T-Bob stole, of course. The meteorite was then put back together, and Hondo was suddenly healed. Yay! <laughs> oh. So, now that we know, we have a bit of a refresher of what the episode's about, um, let's just talk about some of the few controversial things in the episode. And I think the, the big thing is, it's the very first episode, and there's no origin story whatsoever. And... With us being girls, believe it or not, we didn't really care much about the toys. It was the cartoons that we knew. Um, 
totally have no idea how these organizations, Mask and Venom, was formed, how long they've been fighting. And I feel like with having that lack of origin, which usually sets the tone of the show itself, um, it clearly shows that this cartoon was made to be a toy commercial, with, without any doubt. I definitely, every episode is a toy commercial. And that, that being said, there is, there is, a, a, there is kind of an origin story in the cartoon. If you include the Green Nightmare, right, which is, has Matt's father in it, and they, uh, talk about the crystal that powers up the mass themselves. Beyond that, there's no other origin story. I could tell you that when I was writing this fan fiction for the first time, um, the best I knew about the origin story was probably what I heard from the message boards. It had some idea of that having a brother, may I'm still in plans. And so when I was writing my first fan fiction, Water, I thought, I'm going to do something epic. I'm going to write the origin story for Mask. Because nobody out there knows what that is. So, I don't remember what I wrote. I seriously, I don't. Okay? It could have been Mayhem shooting Matt's brother. I don't remember. But I just know that I turned it into the site holder at Mass My Forge. And it was rejected. I as I assumed she wasn't going to publish it. It was wrong. And so, I was sent the link to Albert Pentelow's website, which has the mini comments. Okay, that go with the toys that actually has that origin story in it, which is basically shows that Mayhem took half the plans, left Andy in a burning lab, and Matt went and rushed in and trying to save him, and Andy saved half the plans. Um, so I don't know, what, what's your thought, Darcy? Did you ever uh, have an idea what the origin story was? Would you ever make up your own, or? I never did make up my own. I honestly didn't until a lot later, because as we've said, you know, our experience is cartoon-based, mine especially. So it wasn't until I was older and started, like you, looking around the message boards and realizing, oh, there are these mini comics and web pages and everything. I really didn't know. Uh, and I feel like I had an idea of the origin story by the time I started reading your fix and then writing with you. But yeah, there, you know, the cartoon, there's really nothing. I am glad you mentioned the episode, The Green Nightmare, because that is the one I think of when I think of the origin story. That's the closest we get. We get to see, you know, um, Matt's father and how they got the mass crystal with the natives and everything. I actually need to go revisit that one and if we decide to continue, that's when we should look into definitely reviewing. Um, as far as the cartoon, though, something that I noticed in this particular episode was when in the second half, after they're trying to find the pieces of the meteor, Matt makes a comment as they're taking off to recover the pieces. He says that we have to get that meteor back to, I'm positive it's Kennedy. I played it a second time just to be sure. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's what I heard. And I'm like, okay, so who's Kennedy? I mean, we have no mention of the PNA or anything about what this organization does other than what Matt says to P Professor Stevens that his interests lie in interesting and unique areas. So, you know, that kind of put some question marks up for me. I'm like, what in the world's going on here? I wonder who wrote the script? Yeah. That was a mistake when somebody said I <laughs> You have to wonder what the writers were thinking, but yeah, I'm like, did I really hear that? And that was just what I rewatched this morning. I, did I really hear that? But I'm positive I did. I'll have to go back and see if I can hear that too. <laughs> Thank you. Please. I'd like to know that. I yeah, we'll make sure you're not crazy over there, Darcy. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's unfortunate that there was no um, true origin story in the cartoon. But yeah, if anybody wants to see it, yeah, there, there's copies and many comics out on the internet um, that will give you the true origin story. So another point that I want to bring up, really good controversial point, is Professor Stevens. 
I think that she it would be a wonderful addition to the math team. And I feel like there was a complete violation of the rookies rule um, that if you save somebody, they should be part of your team. Now you may be saying, what are you talking about? These rules, right? Well, let me pull some examples here. Transformer, right? Spike and his family were saved from the stuff cons. Then they were automatically bugs with the, the Autobots, right? Then you have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? April O'Neil. How many times did she say? The Shredder? Spike Turtle? It's practically family with them. And then the last example I'm going to bring up, I'm totally with you if you want to bring up any more Darcy, um, is Brian. From Rainbow Brain. This boy walked through the rainbow with multicolored rainbow patterns. Rainbow Bright took him to Rainbow Land. Okay, let's turn him back to normal. He came back with the key to Rainbow Land. Professor Stevens, he didn't get anything after that. Do you want to add anything on that before I go any further, Jesse? I do. I I two hundred percent with agree with you about percent. Professor Stevens. I mean, she was quite a uh, bad. -y. I mean, she gave Rax and Dagger a pretty good run for their money before they tag teamed her and ran her off the road. So, yeah, two hundred percent missed opportunity there. And then, as far as the you know, the sidekicks, the random sidekicks. Uh, if we go back to GI Joe, one of my favorites in the second miniseries Revenge of Cobra, which might be the weather dominator if I'm remembering correctly. Um, the team picks up both Quick Kick and Shipwreck. Shipwreck, I swear, they pick up in a bar. I forget who it is. I didn't go back and watch, but they pick up Shipwreck in a bar. I remember him having the boat in the desert that takes them where they're going next. And Quick Kick is on some kind of random movie set, from what I recall. And he helps probably kick Cobra's butt or whatever. And then they're like, okay, yeah, join up. You're in the team now. You're part of America's most elite military organization with no training whatsoever. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Stevens got the short end of the deal, 200%. Yeah. So, I also to talk a bit more about that. So, um, so Professor Stevens, right? So, what you brought up to running away from Venom, right? So it's not really clear who, who saved her. I mean, I I have this book here. I I looked at it. It doesn't really say who on earth saved her. And I kind of speculate fan fiction, my fan fiction mind telling me that well, Matt said his guys, his men found Professor Stevens, right? Which makes me think that they had some sort of intel, right? So Matt was probably in the area. So they knew Venom was up to something, and they might have s s saw Professor Stevens, you know, take that dive off the cliff and realize, okay, we can't go after Venom, we have to go save Professor Stevens. Because otherwise, why the heck would she be up on that tractor's couch, okay? Seriously, when do you, why do you pull somebody out of the canyon and say, oh, I should take him to that tractor's mansion instead of a hospital? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> So, and the, so they, they must knew something was going on in the area. So, um, and then when she wakes up, I mean, obviously Matthew disclosed her, his identity, but she realized who he was because he was a public figure. And she said, "Oh, you're Matt Tracker. You're supposed to help people." And he's like, "Well, I only take out their deposits and it, and whatnot." So, at that point, you know, Matt's trying to keep the dead. But at the end of the story, she clearly knows who they are. That they are nasty. Why? Because they're in Boulder Hill. You know what I mean? They're in Boulder Hill, putting this meteorite together, the same condo. And yeah, this confirmed. They're in Boulder Hill. They're not in some lab out in the middle of nowhere. So, it's just wrong that she knew about the secret base. She helped them put the media together. She barely knew they were agents, and she was not allowed to participate in the team going forward. I mean, even if she couldn't be a mask agent, 
Professor Stevens, no, I, I think we've killed that dead horse. Thumbs down, all around. She got the yeah. short end. Don't worry, Professor Stevens. We'll write your story one day. We will. We'll try. We'll do it. Okay. So the next thing that we should probably bring up to you is Matt's horrible parenting, which ended up resulting in this short incident in the back of Firecracker. Um, so, first off, I think it needs to be said, would you give access to your super secret layer to your kids, Darcy? I, I know you don't have any kids, so you have cats, but would you give your access to your, to your secret layer to somebody else? Uh, no, I wouldn't even give it to my cats. First of all, they'd trash it. But yeah, second, second of all, no, that it, that's just no, inappropriate up until a certain age, inappropriate. Nine, ten, whatever Scott's age is, I think we're assuming around ten or so. Yeah, not not acceptable. Not appropriate. I mean, I, I give my, my son five. I'll probably give him password to the, the iPad, but I wouldn't give him access to the super secret layer. That I... <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you just gotta really question that's judgment. I mean, it's not just only having access. Um, it's just some of the lines he said. Like, uh, after Honda was hurt and he, he disappeared and he, what, he got in the switchblade and uh, contacted Matt, and then the first thing Matt says, How are you? I'm worried. And he also mentioned, like, find your way back home. Yeah. Yeah. That, both of those I picked up on. Uh, you know, Hondo's hurt. Brad has just got done saying, Matt, your kid's here. Which, if I may interject before I continue, Brad showed more concern for Scott than Matt was at that time. Which, for me, is pretty pretty epic. Um, my OC, my original fanfic character, is Brad Manessa's daughter. So, I hadn't watched the episodes in a while when I started writing. So, for me, that's good because I showed a very overprotective side for Brad. And so that just really makes me happy. Um, so then here they are, they're like, Scott's gone and Hondo's hurt bad. And all Matt says at that point, he takes his takes off spectrum and then like if this is your son, would you not be flipping? Like, where is my son? Venom's in the area. And we've got to find this meteor. And the same with you, that whole scene with Switchblade is just, it's hysterical, but utterly ridiculous at the same time. Scott, how are you? Oh, Dad, I'm fine. How are you? And he's like, well, I'm worried. And then he says, get back to the house. Ask directions if you have to. So he he's pretty much telling his 10-year-old to hitchhike. Hello. I mean, I know it's the 80s, but... I'm pretty sure we heard PSAs about that in school. You know, the don't talk to strangers and all that. I mean, well, yeah, in I mean, the world. <laughs> I mean, just, and it just. Although, you know, the question, why do they need to see if you see the motorcycle? Right. <laughs> and I do have to give Scott props a little bit at the beginning. Um, of the episode, you know, the puzzle you showed, that's the scene where he takes the black and he looks over at T-Bob. 
I don't think stowing away was such a hot idea. No, Scott, it was pretty stupid. Congratulations for having a little self-awareness for that one moment because the rest of the series, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that oh. that whole scene just, oh. I, another uh, line comes from, well, there's two, there's two things. Well, the other line where Matt said, I don't, when he comes, when Scott comes out of that box, he says, I don't know whether I should hug you or spank you. But frankly, yeah. I think you need to be sent away to boarding school, Scott, because you're just going to do this every single time, interfere, and get yourself put yourself in danger. For your safety, sorry, kiddo, you're going to get sent away. Yeah. See so, ya. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I honestly didn't think about that, but that's pretty epic because that's exactly what happens the rest of the series. <laughs> I mean, just just to add to this is the book, um, this, this is because seriously, he just needed his dad. Uh, in the book itself, um, so the scene where Scott is listening to Matt, there's this check uh, for calling the agents, hearing what the mission is and all that. Uh, Matt actually catches Scott. He's even saying, like, are, are you spying on me? And Scott's like, oh, no, 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 no. And Matt says, you should stay and watch Professor Stevens. So Matt goes and down the tunnel and whatnot to Boulder Hill headquarters. And then Scott's like, oh, come on, T-Bot, let's go. T-Bot said, hold up. Your dad told you to stay with Professor Stevens. He said, no, no. She's resting. He wants her to rest. So as he totally disobeyed his dad's directive, he should just be told him in book to stay home. <laughs> in fact, if T-Bot was a much better mentor, he would have been like, no, Scott, he would have wrapped his whole arm around him. And but that's fault for And we actually touch on that point in our fanfics that Scott is always manipulating the technicalities of a conversation to do what he wants. Uh -huh. Yep, that's throughout the whole entire series. Yep. Oh, uh, all right. <clears throat> Moving on to Scott, because, you know, there'll probably be other days when we're talking about Scott. Yeah, yeah. That I Much, um, much money. I want to bring up something interesting about the book. And even though, I mean, it's the Death Stone, it's the same story. The neat thing about these uh, night books is there's a little extra uh, bits in it that you may not see in the cartoon. And what I want to bring up is what happens after Hondo actually gets hurt because he's not completely unconscious, okay? He has some self awareness of not getting hurt. Um, he's actually asking where Scott is. Um, how is he? And he knows the team's worried about the meteorites. He says, don't worry about me. Go after the meteorite. And Matt's like, no, you're important to Hondo. Okay. So this is what I found surprising. is the fact that they put Hondo in the back of Thunderhawk. Now, that is such a strange choice to me. I mean, I guess maybe it's the fastest way back to Boulder Hill. But... I, I, to me, I would have thought Rhino. I, I don't know. I guess he came from like a makeshift bed in the back of Rhino. Um, but you know, in the cartoon, that Thunderhawk sees the transport and it says, "Oh, I need the. There's the transport. I need to go after to get that meteorite." The poor Hondo is in the back of Thunderhawk, right? So I'm gonna read a little bit here. He says, "This is Matt." They've already made the transfer. I gotta stop the seaplane somehow. And then here's Honda whispering, You can do it, Matt. What? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. And then uh, here's Matt saying with his switch blade, Look, we got company. And then Honda says deeply, Can you shake them off? <laughs> I mean, think about everything that was the whole battle with Thunderhawk and Switchblade. And then after all that, okay, Matt looks over his shoulder and he says, How are you feeling, Hondo? And it says, Matt was horrified. He sees his agent was unconscious. 
sorry. I'll get you back fast. <laughs> I have no words. You have no words. I can't uh, believe I feel bad for Hondo. <laughs> I, what in the... Well, and here's the kicker to that, and now I can see why you asked me to introduce this afterward. Buddy disappears in the episode. Buddy gets one whole line picking on Bruce making no sense at the beginning of the episode when Bruce is explaining that the alien ship, the very poor alien ship, is probably Switchblade. And he, I don't know what the commentary is, but he's like, there you go, it's not making any sense again. That's no, he makes plenty of sense and so on and so forth. So, and we don't even see Betty in Firecracker when the, they're battling the first time. Hondo gets hurt and then just Buddy disappears until the end of the episode where, oh, Hondo's healed, yay! So one would assume from that that Buddy took Hondo back in Firecracker. I mean, the back of a truck bed isn't the best, but an important storm and is staying with him you'd assume because he's never to be seen again in the episode so that might be a nice little fanfic filler like what exactly happened there because it's a much better explanation than what was in that book like that i i lost brain cells over that that's <laughs> he's in the back of thunderhawk seriously injured during a battle and this is his commander rolling <laughs> him around. I mean, what on earth are you thinking, Tracker? This is, oh my lord. I'm glad you saved this so I could be surprised. Yeah, I, I have to wow. Be wow. That's just nuts. That's just nuts. But yeah, another little fanfic bit would be what happens to Buddy? Where is he going? Is he gathering some? intelligence you know we try to give him in our fix a little more of his underground capabilities he's maybe a little more darker a little more darker a little more dark at times but you know so what is he doing well, i don't know I, I like that idea of him being the one to the handle it, it makes the most sense um at this point because uh, i don't think yeah firecracker's not really in scene anymore after Hondo gets injured so Right. Who knows? So Darcy, shall we uh, go into some of our, our favorite moments? Absolutely. Um, uh, go ahead and take it away. There's there's more than I thought in this episode. Um, one of my favorites, I'm going to try to go in order, but I probably won't. Um, when Scott and T-Bob are flying the switchblade, as ridiculous as that conversation is, and T-Bob driving the truck and his old distraction of Venom is hysterical. You know, when he intercepts the deal between Mayhem and his contact, you know, when does the next, next bus to Denver come through? And then in the next scene, they're holding him by, holding him up by his arms. No, I don't know anyone named Mass, but I used to know someone named Marvin. He moved away, which to me is kind of comical because I do have a neighbor named Marvin. Actually, okay. one thing you got to set this scene. If, it, if that's the scene, if that's the first time Miles Mayhem has ever seen T-Bob, um, there's absolutely no excuse for him not to be able to recognize that robot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> episode. Exactly. Unless there's a whole bunch of Miles T-Bobs out there that we don't know about. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Um, another one of my favorites. Um, is the whole scene with Dusty intercepting Rax's delivery. You know, it's just, it's total Looney Tunes. It's literal Looney Tunes. You know, he's, he drives up on the beach and he asks this crowd of people, which way did he go? L Looney Tunes moment. And then the whole scene with the freeze, you know, freeze. When I say freeze, I mean freeze. Now I heard some of Yosemite Sam in there. Oh yes, two two hundred percent. That's one of my favorites. And, and he taps it off and y'all stay cool now. You hear? Yes, <laughs> yes. It's just <laughs> hey, it's cool. you could have arrested him. 
<laughs> it's classic Dusty. Call the call, call, call start the whole event, but you know that that's one of my favorites as well. Yeah, classic Dusty, and then also on the Looney Tunes theme, they had to be thinking Looney Tunes, but um. When Brad is using contour to dodge dagger and lead him to crash into Rhino, he uses antimatter on the one wall, and it's kind of like the portable hole thing or the tunnel with Roadrunner and Coyote. He uses the antimatter. He flies through the the hole, collapses, and dagger crashes through the wall into Rhino. I mean, that's Roadrunner and Coyote right there. I love that you see uh, Kondo using the, the, the laser dive death mode. It was the Mach 3, I think it was, or Mach 1, excuse me. Mach 1, and, yeah. Uh, takes that box and goes to the wall. I completely forgot about that. I mean, I knew it was an antimatter cannon. Um, I, I'll confess, though. I mean, I ended up doing a lot of the writing for battle scenes when we do fan fiction, but a lot of times what I do is I pull it off the toy box. Um, and I have to use my imagination, but I completely forgot, and I agree, it's totally ruined to, that you can make the matter disappear, and then it just suddenly just reappears, like that's the wall. So, yes. yeah, that, that was unexpected, but no, that was totally awesome. Yeah, that, and of course I love Brad, I am unabashedly, unapologetic about that, <laughs> you know, yeah, he's, he's my favorite, so of course just seeing that and the taking candy from a baby line when he rushes through to grab the box and the money's flying all over, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you could uh, two, two of those two of my favorite moments of action. I guess it's worth noting with the, with the theme of the very first episode, I think what, what makes it what's amazing is the, the first time you're seeing the agent call up, which was just, it was a lot of fun. Brad up leaving in the concert. Um, Alex taking that snake off and putting it on his customers. Yeah. I'm sure that's some sort of violation right there. Um, <laughs> Probably. Hondo walking out of the middle of school, which I know our friend Brian Phil Wax is trying to figure out how the heck he still has a job just doing that, because he knows he can't just up and leave in the middle of a school day. <laughs> so, right. Um, then you also have Dusty with the piece on the ground and Buddy. Um, Oh, he's at the gas station. I don't know why he's in a hurry. He's just <laughs> right there. Oh. And I guess the important thing to note, too, because this being the very first episode, the first time you're really seeing the mass come down of epic proportions of everyone reaching out with these powerful masks and putting them on their heads. And the first time you're seeing the cars roll out mm-hmm. over the hill, it just, it, it, it's after effect from the epic. And obviously, it pulls us all in to continue on to watch the cartoon. I agree. I agree. I forget exactly what it, Matt says, but it's something to effect of, let's get started, gentlemen. He pushes the button, and it's just a very somber, quiet scene. Nobody's talking, and the platform to the energy chamber comes up, and the mass energize, and they're turning around, and I'm pretty sure there's kind of a diorama of all the agents kind of accepting their masks just very somberly and officially, you know, okay, we're going into action, guys. You know, this is a pretty serious moment. So, yeah, I I enjoyed that as well. That was very well done. Very well done. Other than that, anything else you want to add? No, I really don't think I have anything else to add. I think that kind of covers it, unless you have anything else. No. All right, then. Well, I guess, so thirsty. I guess we're going to close out then this episode's mission file. I guess this would be a good place to add in the public service announcement for the site this episode. And let me grab my notes back. It was looking both ways before you crossed the street. So always remember that. Uh, So, again, we're going to close out this episode's mission file. Please let us know what you thought about this episode. It's our first. We were a little nervous about recording. Hopefully, we did well for you guys. Um, Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well. Um, That's Lisa, and I'm Darcy for the Mass Mission Files. 
So until next time, stay tuned. Same mask time, same mask channel. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Just gotta live the nation.